Shalom, okay. so, everyone. If you learn, if you remember yesterday, we talked about Hannah and, um, sorry, two days ago we talked about Hannah and about how she she prayed silently, and uh, and so when when she prayed, it was her own prayer, and it was before uh, our great sages of the great assembly. Knesset Agdola, which is now the name also of the Knesset in Israel for the parliament, um, that they wrote the words that we have today. Um, so after they wrote uh, these words, and apparently they counted each one, and each one is very important, um, things changed, and maybe you can call it standardization, like, like they do in hospitals and stuff like that. Um, but there's a purpose uh, either way, and so um, so let's start with the actual law. So it is permitted, according to the Talmud, to recite the Amida in any language. So when the Talmud was written, it was already after um, the, the certain prayers were written, but they still didn't have all the laws and discussions about it, so they con concluded, uh, as opposed to other things that uh, the Talmud discusses in other places, in Sota and in Megillah, um, that the Amida is allowed to be said in any language. However, it is ideal to pray in Hebrew, for that is the language in which Sheikh Nistagla composed the wording of the prayers. Furthermore, Hebrew is the holy tongue and is the language in which the world was created. So when they actually wrote those words, a lot of the time, they took from the verses, but sometimes they they invented words, like in the first blessing before Kriyat Shema, most of those words are not from the verses, and so they were very, very specific about which words they put in there, and uh, that is uh, basically the, um, that, that is basically the, the play that we have to do, uh, if we understand or not, and if you remember, regarding the Kriyat Shema, we do have to say it in Hebrew, at least the first two verses must be in Hebrew, uh, and we'll, uh, we talked about it back then, but uh, let's talk about the different options that we have now that that we don't understand Hebrew, uh, and that's going to be the rest of today's class. Indeed, according to the Reef, only when one is reciting the Amida in a minion is he permitted to pray in another language. The reason for this is that the Shekhinah, the um, presence of God, dwells with a minion, Therefore, his prayer will be accepted even if it is not in the Holy Tongue. However, the prayer of a person who prays individually in a different language, according to the Reef, will not be accepted. Nevertheless, the majority of Poskim agree with the Rosh, uh, who actually lived in, uh, in France, uh, southern France, and the Reef lived in Spain, who maintain that even one praying individually may pray in another language, as long as it is not Aramaic. This is the halachic ruling according to Shulchan Aruch and the Mishnah Brua. So both Ashkenazi and Sephardim rule according to this. And in every Siddur in other languages, you will have a different translation. Even English, until about 100 years ago, everybody used the Adler uh, translation. And uh, everybody in Spanish-talking countries uh, used the uh, Chazan... Uh, uh, Lola, hello. I I forget the actual name, but but I used to have a, a, a machzor of that, um, and now because English has changed a little bit, and also people prefer a modern language. Basically, the idea is that you should pray in the language that you understand. If you don't understand Hebrew, or if you don't understand what you're saying in Hebrew, um, but you should also say it in a language that, uh, meaning in English not Shakespeare in English or whatever, because people do not relate to that today. You should say it in, in a way, in a dialect that is comfortable for you, and, and that way you can concentrate better. An additional advantage to praying in Hebrew, untrue of any other language, is that even if uh, um, he does not understand Hebrew, as long as he understands the first verse of Kriyat Shema and the first bracha of the Amida, he fulfills his obligation. In a different language, only the person who understands what he is reciting can fulfill his obligation through translation. So just for example, I live in Canada and I can read French, but I don't understand most of the words that I'm reading. So if I have, if I pick up a sitter uh, that is in French or Hebrew and French, it is better that I pray in Hebrew, even if I don't understand Hebrew completely, because what I'm reading in French, I don't understand at all, even if I know how to read it. Uh, and so I, I can't translate, not to myself and not to anybody else. 
And so I would not be fulfilling my obligation uh, through that translation. In practice, one who does not understand Hebrew is permitted to choose the language in which he wants to pray. On the other hand, there is a benefit to praying in the language that he understands, for it enables him to have more kavanah. On the other hand, if he prays in Hebrew, he merits praying in the holy tongue. And so again, it's it's up to you and up to your custom, what you got used to. And last but not least, permission to pray in other languages is granted only as a temporary practice, especially specifically for people who do not understand Hebrew. However, it is forbidden to organize a minion of people who pray regularly in a different language. And that was one of the sins of the reform movement, according to the Orthodox understanding, which translated the prayers to German and caused their children to forget the Holy Tongue, leading the way to assimilating and the abandonment of Judaism. So he's not generalizing about people who are reform. He's generalizing about the founders of the reform movement. If, if you know a little bit of the history, Rabbi Moshe Mendelssohn, the founder, was actually an Orthodox rabbi. And so for him to translate to German, even though he understood Hebrew and most of the people that he knew understood the Hebrew language uh, was considered a, a problem. And one of the things that conservative Judaism does today is they insist that even their lectures uh, are given in Hebrew. Uh, and that's their way of, of coming back to, to, to the Hebrew language and, and basically even though rabbinical students always learn uh, text in Hebrew, uh, they also learn them in other languages. And so, um, so that's the main difference between the reform and, and the other movements. Um, and maybe we'll touch a little bit on Kavanah since we have a few more minutes. Um, so one reciting the Amida must have Kavanah, the, the concentration. That is, he must focus on what he is saying. So it would help. If, if you know the language, like we just said, and he must try not to let his mind be distracted by anything else during the prayer. So obviously we can't control our thoughts, but if we have a siddur in front of us and, and we are looking at the words and, and maybe not giving too much attention to them, because then it will take an hour to say the Amida, but if we just um, are able to concentrate and not let our, our thoughts go otherwise, if other thoughts enter his mind, he must expel them and return to his prayer. Even if he does not succeed in concentrating on all the words, he must at least try to have kavanah for the conclusion of each bracha. If he cannot concentrate during all of the brachot, he must take and make an effort to concentrate in Birkat Avot and Birkat Modim, which we said are the most important. Those are the brachot in which we bow down at their beginning and at their end. At the very least, he must have kavanah in Birkat Avot, the bracha that opens the Amidah. So um, we have a gradual way of, of prioritizing. Uh, obviously, it would be best if somebody could concentrate on all 1,800 words of the Amidah, but if if they're not able to, at least at uh, the, the end of the brachot, if they're not able to do even that, then at least um, Birkat Avot and Birkat Modim in its, in its entirety. And if not even that, uh, only Birkat Avot, which is the most important blessing. And so I think we talked about if somebody is, is on a train or on a plane and wants to pray sitting down, which is actually what's recommended, um, the most important is to concentrate on the first blessing. After that, obviously, we can't control all 200 passengers. And so um, and so that's, that's why. Um, and and the, if you remember, the reason why we do that at that time is because uh, we don't want the time of, of Shmoneser to pass. The time of Shmoneser to pass is, is more important than uh, the Kavana that we have to have during the Amidah. And we'll stop here, continue a little bit tomorrow with this idea of Kavana and other laws about, um, about the Amidah.